This podcast is brought to you by Always Possible. Alwayspossible.co.uk Hello, I'm in the cafe of an innovation hub. So excuse the ambient noise, but it is apt for what I'm looking at in this episode of the Possibility Club. The intersection of artificial intelligence, content and media isn't just a technological pivot. It's a question of narrative, of storytelling, of how we interact with the world around us through the lens of media. And as AI becomes more entrenched in this landscape, does it sharpen or does it blur our lens? In this episode of The Possibility Club, we're delving into the fabric of this modern narrative. The script is changing, the actors are evolving, and the stage is expanding. It's a realm where algorithms are the new editors, and data is the ink. Yet amidst this digital choreography, where does the human touch reside? And also, where is it headed? Joining us is a big thinker in the media business. His expertise finds its roots in academia, blooms in entrepreneurship and resonates in the corridors of the entertainment industry and major UK charities. Author of the media business and artificial intelligence, his writings are more than just a dalliance with theories, they're a deep dive into the interplay between AI and media. His academic roles at St Hughes College Oxford, the Said Business School and at the National Film and Television School look under the bonnet of the business of arts, culture, tech and entertainment. He's been lauded with nominations for Entrepreneur of the Year and has crafted narratives both digital and cinematic with production companies Ten Alps and Endemol Shine North. His current roles at UNICEF UK and the Halley Orchestra symbolise a narrative that looks beyond commercial metrics, but one that is serious about social change. How can we all navigate the expanse of media, technology and social impact, maintaining a useful dance between ethics, innovation and tradition and disruption. I'm Richard Freeman, and this is the Possibility Club, with my distinguished guest this week, a sage at the confluence of AI, media, and content, Dr. Alex Connock. Hello, hello, hello. It's Possibility Club. It's Richard Freeman here, your inimitable host, looking at change, growth and innovation and thinking about all the turning cogs in this crazy world of ours. And as usual, I've got a fantastic guest who I'm going to explore that with. And today we'll be talking about all things media and AI, kind of where policy meets practice from someone who's really been there, seen it, done the T-shirt. No, that's wrong. Academic, media executive, entrepreneur, uh, Dr. Alex Connick. You've done all of it. How do you describe yourself, uh, Alex? What's your pithy one liner? <laughs> you know, I, I don't have a pithy one liner. That's probably the tragedy of it. I tell you, though, you say you're inimitable. That's kind of a challenge today, isn't it? Because an AI person could probably do a facsimile of your voice and your video and possibly imitate you. It's a really interesting point, isn't it? Is, yeah. is any of us truly inimitable anymore, even if we aspire to be, which is fascinating. Um, yeah, so I'm really, really interested in um, media and I'm really, really interested in AI. And I'm, I had my sort of career has been a story of Game of Two Halves where the first half or the slightly more than half was actually working in the media, specifically the TV business and advertising, trying to run companies and make shows and all those things, make money. And um, and then I sort of had a vision from the mountain top that I wanted to go into academia and ended up um, at a couple of places, um, notably Oxford and also the National Film and Television School and next to university, at all of which I specialize in media and ai the media business and ai and what a subject it is in 2023 indeed and yes i loved your sort of provocation at the beginning there absolutely what is imitation these days what is authenticity what is real yes i've been enjoying lots of ai deep fake replication of stuff and it's it's both terrifying but also it's quite exciting isn't it well it's interesting because companies they're trotting out two kind of alternative paradigms at the moment. On the one hand, they're saying, yes, we must be authentic. All our communications must be authentic. Um, we must truly live, you know, that our ESG credentials, we mustn't just be playing lip service to them. We're not greenwashers. We're not astroturfers. And then the next meeting they're going to, they're going, right, synthetic content. What are we going to do here? You know, how can we, we get rid of all our stuff and replace them? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. 
Exactly. And so and so you could say, well, they're authentically deep fake. <laughs> I suppose you could say that. But nonetheless, I think companies are caught between a, a sort of fascinating moment in history where there are twin dynamics, which appear to be heading in opposite directions, but in many ways, I think, are both parts of the same thing. And so you mentioned kindly that I'd done a book, I think, on, on media and AI. Well, I have anyway, done a book on media and AI, and it was quite interesting. And it was you know, all about the digital landscape of the early 2020s and how fundamentally different that is from the previous uh, generations. But actually, I'm now doing a book on the media and live experience, which is kind of the opposite, okay. which is Glastonbury, the Champions League final, the FA Cup final, Coachella, uh, you know, theme parks, anything that involves live human experience. And I think they're two parts of the same thing in respect of whilst we're increasingly digitizing our lives and making them imitable, to pick up on our earlier point, we're also simultaneously looking for that authentic touch experience that you, you can only get by being in the kind of golden circle at Glastonbury or whatever. And that's equally valid too. And then so, so the Taylor Swift tour and the Beyonce tour and the Coldplay tour, they're all absolutely maxed out this, this summer because everybody's trying to have that authentic live experience at the same time as chat GPT is reaching five a million subscribers in five days and stable diffusion is being integrated into every possible media creation tool. And we're heading headlong into a deep learning driven um, AI creation world. Mm -hmm. And you could say, well, those two things are contradictory but also in some funny way, complementary. What wasn't the promise of the metaverse, the sweet spot in the middle? Well, yeah, I mean, the metaverse is very interesting because, of course, the 2021 to 2 was kind of the year of the metaverse. And at the time, the, the paradigm was going to be everyone's going to have an avatar and that avatar is going to sit and kind of represent them in this kind of virtual rendition of the world. And then actually... Apple have sort of slightly blown that up, haven't they, with the um, goggles, I forget their official name, because what they've done is they said, no, everyone's not going to have an avatar, everyone's going to be in some level um, themselves in the metaverse, in a kind of AR as opposed to VR way, and um, so, so there isn't going to be this parallel universe, there's going to be a kind of enriched sort of first universe, if you if you will. Both those kind of paradigms create really interesting philosophical challenges, which we haven't really got to grips with yet. I think that's possibly, to circle back to your original question, why I find my job so interesting. It's because on the one level, you're talking about these quite prosaic things, you know, this new tools launched or this bit of machine learning does this, or whatever, fairly mundane software stuff. And on the other hand, talking about these really big philosophical issues, like what is creativity? What is copyright? What is consciousness? What is network you know and to marry those two things together every day is genuinely fascinating and a privilege we're speaking on a day when the creative industries commission launched their major vision for i guess it's, it's sort of saying what what the creative industries needs to do over the next few years and it's fully government endorsed for good or bad you know it's quite long i haven't still worked my way through it there's still kind of the need to defend the role of the creative industries or to keep reminding people what a sort of force it can be in terms of commerce, economy, but also these philosophical conversations you're talking about. But it still feels it needs to compete for airtime when it comes to, to politics and policy. You know, what's your experience been from someone who's been very much inside the creative industries over the last 20, 30 years to now perhaps as an academic observing, analysing, commenting. Do we get it right? Do we understand what the creative industries can and should do as, as a country properly? I think we actually probably do, interestingly, that actually the great British export is probably cultural capital. You know, it's, it is things like AI and it is things like creative industries. I think to be fair to the government in that report that you mentioned, they actually do put money, real actual money into the creative industries as well as sort of permission and um you know other forms of soft um sort of investment and that's really helpful so so one of the institutions i'm involved with national film and television school which is a fantastic place um is involved in a in a project with royal holloway i think in pinewood as well around technical skills and it looks to me having not read the port properly and having not been involved in the bid and so don't don't sort of quote me on any of the detail but it looks to me like that project has secured some backing and that sounds like a really good thing to me you know and i think the other universities that i'm at too you know and oxford university obviously is incredibly embedded in the kind of intellectual capital development of britain and arguably oxford and cambridge are the best export that britain has you know mm -hmm. I, I think. And similarly, Exeter University is very good at um, the, the, all this stuff. So I, I think the government is very alive to this now. And having met a lot of the people behind, for example, both the creative industries policy and the AI policy of the UK, of course, they both have sat within the DCMS. 
Um, I think there's a lot of um, quality understanding at government level now of the value of our intellectual property. And in a world where our population is 127th of the population of India, we need to find ways to compete that aren't just about trying to you know, sell cheaper coal or whatever it might be. You know, we have to find ways to um, to exploit our cultural intellectual skills. So I'm sort of optimistic, actually, um, about our future in that, in that respect. We're a small country that does punch above its weight when it works. And I guess at the heart of it, you do need to see collaborations between politics, academia and business to be able to harness and sort of, for want of a better word, exploit the, the multiple values of this. Do you think that there should be more of that? My very brilliant colleagues in the marketing team at Said Business School in Oxford are uh, very regularly publishing with and around the very biggest tech companies in the world and, and big beauty companies and other consumer companies, really marketing, market leading research, and very heavily embedded so, so that they're able to bring together their very rigorous academic skills with the huge data sets um, of you know the, the very biggest companies, the Metas, the Googles, and what have you. And that's a, that's a real powerful thing. And then at National Film and Television School, I, I don't think I've ever been in an organization which is so embedded in industry, which on an hourly basis has visits from Amazon and Netflix and Channel 4 and BBC and Pimax Studios, and uh, the list goes on. You know, The best universities have absolutely understood that th there's a kind of win-win by engaging with industry and and actually interestingly vice versa so i think britain probably cherishes its academic leadership more now than it did say 20 years ago there's less of this nonsense about oh no they're all in ivory towers and they all just wear tweed jackets and all that you know i don't i don't see that on either side of the equation i don't see that reality on the ground if i if i'm in oxford you know, I've booked a lot of guests for Oxford sessions. So I um, co-ran and then ran the um, AI for Business a diploma, sort of postgrad course at Oxford for a few years. And um, it was really interesting because I think of all the booking jobs I've ever done in my life, that was the one, you know, and I've done chat shows, you know, magazines, you, know, you name it. You know, that's the one where, where you put the call in and you stand the best chance of getting the guest, you know, sure. and so the industry really wanted to come. You know, and I booked incredible organizations, you know, it was, you know, it wasn't always easy, but it definitely got them in. Yeah. And, you know, they were very, very keen to engage on a really substantive level. And at the end of the sessions, they would always say, oh, I loved that. It was great. You know, and I must have booked like 100 AI, I guess, pretty much the who's who of AI in the UK and US. You know? And uh, they, they loved it. You know, they, they, they really loved the engagement and they loved they wanted to stay longer. And I had sessions that overran by an hour and a half, you know, with the mm -hmm. national security, somebody or other from somewhere or other, you know, and you're just like, wow, I can't believe these people got the time and it's just that they really really wanted to engage and i think that's a sign of the times and and, and so i i think we're kind of in a good place actually britain's kind of got its act together it started to engage its best universities in, in with its you know best industry research and not before time and you know with plenty to be achieved because you know this is sort of partisan but you know brexit hasn't been an overwhelming economic success from what i can tell <laughs> We probably need to, um, you know, start powering up our economy a bit. And, you know, whether or not you support the Tories in general, I think it'd be hard to disagree that Rishi Sunak has not, you know, has got stuck in on this kind of industrial policy, you know, ownership of AI. We're probably the third biggest player in the world in AI. Uh, you know, we have DeepMind, for example, in the UK, the division of Google now, but, but a phenomenal uh, AI research company. We have others too. Uh, and uh, you know we, we need to get we need to get going because that's that's what that's what's going to make the UK economy relevant and going to pay for our schools and hospitals. A lot of my work is is in the kind of tier one or two below that. You know, I, I do a lot of work in in Brighton Hove, which is a, you know a real hotbed of emerging creative industries, the sort of supply chain to the supply chain of your uh, your Googles and so on. But they're doing some really exciting stuff and starting to work more with with local universities on innovation projects and so on. But do you feel that investment is trickling down there? These emerging and more sort of perhaps testbed laboratory type stuff that's happening outside of the, the corporates? It's a good question. It's ever been thus. It's a perennial issue in Britain that there isn't enough um, seed funding or early stage venture capital. And uh, actually also that there isn't enough kind of mid-tier series B venture capital either. Um, even the larger companies tends to get bought out by private equity or by US publicly owned companies before they get the chance to list on the stock exchange. I think all of those things are true. 
I think that um, you know the British kind of finance infrastructure is not particularly geared towards funding entrepreneurship, particularly in tech. It tends to prefer you know dividend paying, boring machine tool you know factories or whatever you know, and that's why the London Stock Exchange is a graveyard in the in the words of one hedge fund manager you know of kind of mining and oil and what have you you know as opposed to the New York Stock Exchange which is full of these kind of incredibly sexy companies. So we have huge work to do. Uh, at least we've spotted the problem. And to your point on Brighton, yes, I think Brighton is a very fecund creative environment, and and that's a real success story of the last twenty years, probably. And you know, Britain's always been good at that kind of organic startup, and you can find the same similar pattern in Glasgow, Newcastle, Bristol, Manchester, where I grew up. You know, and and obviously, you know, East London or and West London. So we're good at we're good at ideation. We're good at music musicians. We're good at you know fundamental AI ideas and fundamental media format ideas. Perhaps we're not as good as we should be at scaling them up. Even before their current travails, when I looked at the CBI conferences, I always thought it was like watching Aliens because it was just full of people. These kind of men in suits, kind of Marks and Spencer suits, talking about the golf or whatever. And I just it just built no relation to anything that I ever saw in business. Like they didn't even look like people I saw in business. You know, because you know the kind of t-shirt wearing world that I operate in. I think it's really interesting. I've always hated the TV show The Apprentice for the same reason because. To anyone who's worked in business, the kind of paradigm of success on The Apprentice is almost the quintessentially the opposite of what you actually have to do to succeed in business, which is get on with people, be a team player, not not do one upmanship and so forth. The kind of establishment of Britain's business hasn't quite embraced the tropes of how you really succeed in kind of media and tech in a way that probably the capital, venture capital and private equity establishment of Silicon Valley probably has. You know, famously, Mark Zuckerberg turned up to his meeting at Sequoia Capital when he was pitching Facebook in pajamas late and pitched a different company because he didn't want any of their investment. You know, and the idea that you could ever do that in Britain is so ludicrous that, um, you know, you can see we've got a way to go. This podcast is brought to you by Always Possible. But who are we? Always Possible works with ambitious businesses, charities and public services that are thinking about what's next. From architects to aerospace companies, puppet theatres to primary schools, business networks to big data analysts. If you're wanting to be brave with some big decisions or to be clearer about what to prioritise, then an award-winning workshop from the Always Possible team is a brilliant starting point. We care about just one thing, building ideas that work. For creative, intuitive and practical expertise, consider Always Possible as your strategic partner. Find out more about how we could power up your mission, visit alwayspossible.co.uk. Alwayspossible.co.uk And and look at the, the, the travails of the CBI at the moment. It's not just oh, yeah. that sort of business attitude. It's, it's, beha- it's, it's very 20th century behaviour. As well, you know, it's endemic, isn't it? I don't know anything about the particular stories, but I, I, I do know that I thought anyway that the CBI wasn't a relevant organisation to the kind of people I knew in media entertainment. You know, so it just didn't. It, it, it was, it was, un, it was an unthinkably unbridgeable divide. Yeah. You know, in terms of the kind of the sheer, the sheer kind of design ethic of their conference and what they wore and how they presented it and how they even thought about industry. The last time I talked about The Apprentice on this podcast, as I was interviewing Deborah Meaden, and, and um, in her words, not mine, you know, that's not a business program. Um, and then the Sun picked it up and, just, and and declared that Deborah Meaden was having a war with with Alan Sugar based on that one comment. Oh, really? Podcast, yeah. I've got another interesting point for you. Is I think that the British civil service is ahead of the British body politic on the value and importance of media and tech. If I look at the goings on in Parliament over say a year i think very very rarely see discourse that i feel fully matches the reality of life on the ground in in creative industries and you know that i've seen whereas when i meet civil servants i find that they're very heavily engaged with it and i I sort of wonder whether it's like disconnect where the political class by embracing the political life somehow disassociate themselves with the reality of what's going on in the ground in our more creative and kind of uh, brainy industries and somehow defaults to a more sort of 
I don't know what the, you know, um, sort of old school 1970s vision of what the British economy is. And I think that's a really interesting point. It's, it's, it's quite rare that I, that, I, that I find that point contradicted from what I see in Parliament, today being a good example. It's obsessed with its own process and it's an ex-leader who isn't even an MP anymore. And we're not worrying about what we should be worrying about, which is how we're going to reboot this economy, how we're going to fire up our you know, world leading industries and universities and how we're going to take on the economic challenge of 10 percent inflation and, you know, a geopolitical situation and so forth. It's a kind of slightly self-absorbed our political class in a way, perhaps that the civil service are less so. But isn't politics itself the sort of enemy of entrepreneurialism? You know, politics is about an optics strategy. It's about trying to appeal to a huge number of very, very different thinkers and audiences at the same time, and therefore kind of appealing to nobody. It's all about um, mm. compromise and navigation, whereas entrepreneurialism is kind of follow your nose, break stuff, put it back together again, you know, do it and then figure out later and and, and be nimble. You know, almost yeah. that's the opposite of kind of what politics allows for. And and maybe that will change over time. I don't know. But I think you're right. I think I think it's it's um, there is a big disconnect there, certainly as a body as a body politic. There might be individual politicians that get it politics aside. But someone like Ed Vasey has been quite instrumental with the with the with the creative industries um, now from the Lord. But um, yeah, he has. But, you know, the last time I heard him, he was broadcasting on Times Radio from the Glyndebourne Opera. You know, I don't know whether that really constitutes full connection with the grassroots creativity of Britain that's going to drive us into the 21st century. I mean, yes, it's the creative industries, but it's the Glenbourne Opera. The other thing is that fabulous at the moment is for all the for all the kind of dystopian headlines, every single day in my news feed, five or so, you know, five or even ten things come in where I go, wow, that's a completely new, that's a completely new way of looking at something. You know, in AI, that's particularly true. So, you know, the idea that large language models, which we thought were just about next word prediction in a kind of quite raw statistical way, actually turn out to have a kind of worldview, as the great, as its creators have said, and somehow through the kind of deep learning that they're doing, come to understand the statistics of language and even human thought in a way that is much more meta than we had previously thought. And that's kind of very recent or the very, or the idea that you can, you, but by conversing with them, you could in a sort of supervised learning way, but on a local level, you can start to train them to think in much more sophisticated and less hallucinatory ways. Mm. Um, you know, these are, these are really, really interesting situations coming into the creative industries and the fact industries in general, which we've barely started to scratch the surface of in terms of their significance and opportunity. And I think that is really going to define, you know, assuming we're all still here and there isn't some big blow up that uh, is really going to define the sort of mid 2020s and, and in a fast, fascinating and fantastic way. I've got a sort of standard speech at the moment, which is about the media and AI, which is kind of based on my thinking from my book and then just tons of examples. And I've given it maybe, I don't know, 10, 15 times in the last month. Often, often I give them it, even to quite sophisticated audiences, they've just not said anything. Like usually when you give a talk, especially a lecture, people are interrupting you all the time, you know, and no one, no one says anything. At the end, I go like, why has no one said anything? Because I've been that bad. And they were going, no, 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 we just didn't know any of this. Like we just didn't know that you could do that or that people were doing that or that the training data libraries were an issue or that we, you know, the copyright could be a challenge or all this stuff that, you know, that, that is kind of relatively well known in kind of California and, and sort of the right circle in London hadn't really made it into the mainstream yet. I think we're at a fascinating time where, where really big new ideas are coming into play that hadn't been there before. The smartest people that I know at the moment are actually the philosophers, particularly at Oxford. There's an AI ethics institute there whose entire job is to try and figure this stuff out. And even they're saying we can't figure it out. You know, any lawyer you talk to, and I've spoken to several lawyer, legal conferences recently, will say, yeah, we really can't work out what's going on at the moment. There are definitely not, not the answers yet. And so that's a really interesting time to be alive in a way. And I sort of wish I was at the beginning of my career, not the end, because I think I think the people who are who are in the sort of 20 now have got astonishing careers ahead of them in a really fascinating ways that we just can't imagine. I take it you you weren't an, you weren't a signatory to these open letters then sort of pleading for AI to slow down doesn't sound no, like I wasn't, I, yeah. I wasn't asked. I'm, def, I'm not on the right mailing list, but even had I been, I would not have signed it. And my argument there would be that it's um, pointless. And the reason it's pointless is because it's a quintessential prisoner's dilemma. If you said, let's have a six-month pause, and you had six companies who all agreed to a six-month pause, the incentive to cheat 
for any one of those companies. Yeah, It'd be so high that every company being rational economic actors and having shareholders to answer to would have to cheat and buy them all cheating in a classic prisoner's dilemma equation, they would all end up losing. You know? oh, I'm, I'm deeply cynical. It feels like a yeah. letter written by lots of people saying, I need you all to slow down. So that yeah, we exactly. Can, we, we and the, can, the, the idea uh, that Elon Musk, who has at least three AI driven companies already, would be t- t- saying to them, oh, hey, Tesla, don't bother developing that automated driving software for the next six months. Or, or maybe we could exclude that. I mean, that's the other thing. It'd be one of those exceptionalism things where you'd say, yeah, of course, large language models will cut back on, but self-driving, we'll keep that. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, it's ludicrous. You know? yeah. So I, I think, I mean, I do believe that AI regulation is vital. And I think it's interesting that Britain is trying to position itself as a driver yeah. of that. And, and I hope we succeed. I'm, I'm just a tiny bit skeptical because I wonder when push comes to shove, whether America would really accede to the six major AI companies who are driving all of its stock market growth this year being in any way regulated or constrained by essentially a foreign regulator. You know, it just doesn't seem credible to me. It doesn't feel yeah, like here and Meta and Google and so forth would do Alphabet, you know, would be it would would be subject to such thing. It is is not going to work. And it's it's not going to work for America because because that's that's the only growth that America's got at the moment and in terms of its stock market capitalization. But I think it's good that Britain's putting itself in the middle of the conversation and, and knowing some of the people in you know in government civil service who are doing it, they are incredibly impressive and they really know what they're talking about. So we have the intellectual wherewithal to make it happen. But whether whether sort of into the real politics of it, we're actually going to deliver it is a slightly different question. But yes, please, let's position ourselves. And you know, in pure AI research academically, we are third in the world. And in terms of your your work, you know, what do you want to be famous for? To to, to use a, a put it in a crass way, but you know, when when people are looking back at the legacy of your work in hundred years time or something like this, and, and all the different things that you you had a, an impact on, you know, what is it that you you would like to be kind of known for as in terms of what you changed or what you challenged or what you what you enabled? Well, I don't think I'll be famous, and I don't think I'll be looked back in hundred years time. But I think that the area that I'm interested in. The, the confluence of media and AI is a really valid topic. Uh, you know, it's, there's an interesting sort of anecdote there is that in 2020, roughly, I realized that, um, you know, the power of recommendation algorithms had, you know, fundamentally changed media distribution. And the old um, models of how media business worked with the verticals of kind of publishing newspapers, magazines, you know, film exhibitions stuff were kind of defunct. And therefore all the textbooks that wrote about them were also defunct. So I said, right, I'll write a new textbook and I'll write about the media through the lens of uh, media and artificial intelligence. And so Routledge, which is the publisher, you know, got me to fill in this form, which is like, this is what I'm going to do. And they sent it out to sort of anonymized gurus around the world. Almost all of whom came back and said, why would you want to do a book about media and artificial intelligence? They're just two unrelated subjects that don't don't have any traction. You know, it's a kind of it's a kind of point. Don't you know that media is all about publishing in newspapers? And, you know, and I thought at the time, you know, you're just wrong. You know, Mm -hmm. but anyway, two years later, when they ultimately published the book, obviously they were wrong because the media and artificial intelligence are absolutely fused together. And and just barely a day passes, barely an hour passes without a newspaper story about the collision of those two gigantic um, sort of presences in our world now. And that's only going to, that's only going to grow as media becomes affected more profoundly by artificial intelligence at all stages of the production process. So it started with, reinforcement learning and what have you in the uh, recommendation algorithms of people like Netflix back in 2009, Netflix actually held a competition to, you know, a million dollar competition for someone to write the, the algorithm that would drive its recommendation algorithm. And that's arguably what made Netflix special in the whole period between about 2009 and 20, when it came to sort of dominate the world, went from this small mail order firm into the biggest TV and film production you know, operation in the world. And that was really the recommendation algorithms that did that. And that was on the distribution end of any the lifespan of any given media project. So the very last stage, if you will, when it's being shown to the viewers. And actually, it was only about 2017 that you started to see machine learning really get into the production tools, the kind of post-production tools, edit, special effects and sound editing and so forth. So that was only when that it became really common in in that field. And that's obviously slightly earlier in the production process. And then finally, it's only been in the last year that uh, AI tools have made their way, generative AI particularly, into the very earliest stage of the creation of media project, which is the development, the conception, the creation stage, which is why suddenly the writers of Hollywood are 
did dealing with the how, how to format uh, deals with the studios around the notion of authorship when AI might be involved and so forth. So we're only just at the beginning of this process where AI is now embedded in every step in the production sequencing of any given media project. And it'll take us you know, a long time to really figure out e even the basics of how that's going to play play through in this wonderful industries that we have from theater to theme parks to, you know, via TV, film, games, so forth. Mm -hmm. So it's it's very very fascinating and 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 quite material as well to our economy. And so so um, I love I love being in this space. It's fun. I mean, I'm looking here. I've got some slides. I just gave a speech to some people in Florida just before this chat. Little screenshots. I've got Grimes gives fans permission to use her voice on songs created by AI. So the idea that an artist, far far from trying to crack down on the copyright infringement of using generative AI tools, will actually say, "No, no, I'll monetize it. I'll take fifty percent split of anything that you do using my voice." Venezuela using fake AI American newscasters to spread disinformation. That's pretty interesting. There's a company in California called Synthesia, which makes kind of corporate video hosts that you can use for your corporate video without actually having real people. That's been turned into disinformation by Venezuela. How to proof your data against training data set integration. Really interesting. BBC News chief fears frightening impact on AI of audience trust as bots spread. You know, there's just stories galore. Every dimension you can think of. Magazines editor sat over AI generated Michael Schumacher interview. Every day, something new, something philosophical, something technical, and and all of the all of the above kind of combined. And it's happening at a granular level, isn't it? Now, you know, now that the yeah. kind of entry to this is is starting to to lower, you know, it, you gave the example earlier, the you know, audience is still trying to get their heads around it. But the explosion of the, you know, even the early chat GPT models, there's now very, very few people I know in any sector that aren't playing around with it. And I think the idea that you could put the genie back in the box and you could ban chat GPT from university exams or, you know, submissions or whatever is like, it's ludicrous because it's, it's never going to make it work. But I think the, the odd paradox of all of that is it might take us back to a better form of assessment and a better form of student teacher interaction or workplace interaction, because the only way to really mitigate whether people are using chat GPT is either to stick them to sit them down in an examination hall, like in the 16th century and make them write by hand or to actually talk to them. Critical thinking. Yeah. Have a conversation. Yeah. So, so you're finding that you know universities who've who've academics at none of the places I work, but in general, academics tend to be quite student shy and try to find lots of reasons not to talk to students. And in fact, now now the best the best way of of testing students is going to be a viva, you know, like like in the old school, you know, which is great, you know. I was writing a proposal for something yesterday, and I've and I put in loads of previous proposals examples in, into a, an, an AI generative tool, and and, and kind of said right. Can you use all these previous examples to create an answer to this new question? Yeah. I just mm. wanted to see what it what it came up with and, and and how it would frame some examples of work that my company have done. Those of it were really accurate, really helpful, some good phrasing. And then it made up an award ceremony that I designed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it said, always possible, were responsible for this uh, this innovative award ceremony, which celebrated X, Y, Z. And I was thinking, I mean, that's absolute bullshit. There's no, there's not a grain of truth in that. Yeah. I thought that's really fascinating that it sounds very plausible. And so then it puts it on me as the, the kind of co-author, I don't know, to go, should I keep that in because it sounds good or should I absolutely take it out? And of course, I'm going to take it out, but others might not, you know. So that's the hallucination problem. And there are ways of using prompts to mitigate that. So you could go back in and ask a second level of question. You could say, please, could you verify your answer against the full data yeah. set of, of events that have taken place or whatever? And so there are phraseologies. Actually, there's a really, really good talk, which I highly recommend to people by Andre Carpathy. So K A R P A T H Y on YouTube from OpenAI. So an hour long talk, very technical, but don't be put off because he, towards the end of that talk, he does address the hallucination um, topic and he looks at some really interesting ways of using prompts to mitigate it, not to fully get around it. Because the problem is that the, the internet is, is as a training data set is full of right answers and wrong answers. Mm -hmm. so, so it's been trained on the wrong answers as well. But if you if you use phraseology correctly, you can prompt a system to check its own homework and get more accurate. And I think that's the that's the kind of thing that that people are going to learn very quickly to do. Yeah.
So, and, you know, the, my fake academic publishing history in marine biology or my, you know, my, my past as a, you know, Polish rock star, all these things are available, it's just the click of a button. Absolutely. But I think, we have, you know, the, but there are going to be ways to filter that and to get to a, something more of a similitude of the truth, you know. But that prompting, that reframing, that that questioning, they are good skills for people to learn. Oh, yeah, uh, definitely. In a way yeah. that they don't, I don't think they do with search engines at the moment, you know. Um, Not at all. That's a really good point. That's a very, very good point. Um, it's, a, you know, we're, we're sort of bemoaning that but we don't remember that we're already filtering through a imperfect lens when we just do a google search for anything so um yeah, yeah good point. And more or less accurate than most of the media uh yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. well it's quite i mean every time you pick up the sun or the daily mail or any newspaper or even the guardian you yeah. are at some level allowing that sort of dark side of the moon album cover prism to somehow filter your universe in a way that ceases to be fully objective that's for sure well i guess the irony is this this thing that it made up that i definitely hadn't done um was a really good idea who knows might, might be the most lucrative thing i ever do um but then, then whoever had the training data in there will come looking for you for the copyright <laughs> Uh, that seems a good point to, to to wrap up. I've got some time, but um, really, really fascinating conversation. Well, thank you, Richard. Really good chat. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Alex Connick, for being on the Possibility Club. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Possibility Club Practical Bravery. If you enjoyed this episode, do like, share, review, tell everybody about it. Look in the show notes for all the details of today's guest, stuff we talked about, stuff that's of interest, new things to read, new things to listen to. And if you are running a business or a charity and you are trying to accelerate or improve the impact that you have in the world, if you want to be famous for what you do and what you change rather than just what you sell, then talk to us alwayspossible.co.uk We want to hear from you, we want to talk to you, we want to amplify and elevate your ideas, and who knows, we might be able to help you feel more confident and clear about what's next. alwayspossible.co.uk We'll be back in a couple of weeks with a new special guest and a new insight on practical bravery in action. The Possibility Club is an always possible podcast. The interviewer was Richard Freeman for Always Possible and the producer and editor was me, Chris Thorpe Tracy, for Lo-Fi Arts. Have a good week. Alwayspossible.co.uk Lo-Fi Arts